So you are the U.S. Special Representative for Racial Equity and Justice. This is a new position created by the Biden-Harris administration, and you are the first person in this role. I, I am. Tell us a little bit about why this role was created and what does your new job entail? Great question. Glad we're starting there. So this, the creation of this role is a continuation of the Biden-Harris administration's commitment to advancing human rights and centering human rights in our foreign policies. It is an acknowledgement that the unfortunate reality is that for members of marginalized racial and ethnic communities, the basic premise outlined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, that all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights, is an aspiration but not a reality. So. The creation of my position is to really acknowledge that we need to center equity in our work. And it, I have the honor of joining a roster of an ambassador for religious freedom, ambassador to combat anti-Semitism, an ambassador for global women's issues, a special envoy for LGBTQI plus rights, and a special advisor for disability rights to ensure that we are advancing a foreign policy that really centers equity and working towards a world in which all human beings are free and are able to live up to their full potential. Tell us a little bit more about you and uh, tell us about your, your background and what, is, what has prepared you for this role. Sure. Well, so I'm from LA, Los Angeles, uh, more specifically Inglewood, California, which until recently, you know, whenever people heard about Inglewood or saw it in movies or television shows, it was always a negative thing, right? Uh, lots of connotation about um, gangs and drugs and violence. Uh, but that's not the Inglewood I experienced. Uh, my family came from, to Inglewood from Louisiana um, and I was raised by my grandparents uh, with my, my mom as well. And my grandfather was a well-known civil rights activist. So I can say that this is sort of in my blood, uh, sort of fighting for social justice and equality for all people. Um, I started my career in foreign affairs. Um, I received a fellowship when I was in college to join the Foreign Service. And so I began my career as a Foreign Service officer. I did tours in Mexico, in South Africa, as well as here in Washington, D.C. And that enabled me um, a, a really intimate understanding of how the State Department works and how we engage in the world. I then worked in the private sector, uh, working with major foundations and companies and startups interested in investing in countries across Southern and East Africa. And I helped them do that in a manner that was that created uh, sustainable and real benefit for the local communities in which they were investing. Then I joined civil society and I advocated for more just, humane and equitable foreign policies towards Africa, towards Europe and Eurasia, and was beginning to build out a global work, a global platform to combat global anti-black racism. Then I was honored to come back home to the State Department uh, in 2021, where I served as a senior advisor in the Bureau of International Organization Affairs, where I led our work to advance racial justice issues multilaterally. You, you spoke earlier about the place that you're from and how there, there are all these negative perceptions about that. I think that is one thing that Africans can relate to, how a place and its people can be framed or portrayed in a way that affects the way people are seen and perceived. And, you know, America itself is, is often praised and criticized for having strings attached to its foreign aid, especially when it comes to, uh, you know, its diplomatic engagement with countries that they have to improve their human rights record. Is the work that you're going to be doing going to affect a country's relationship with the United States? Well, let me start by saying this. We recognize that we are not perfect and we are grappling with issues of racism, discrimination and xenophobia here in the United States as well. So we start from a perspective of humility, but we also recognize that these are global phenomena, right? Um, and so we have to start 
with our own work and how we are engaging with these communities in the countries. So let me be crystal clear that my job is not to admonish or lecture other governments on how they are treating marginalized racial and ethnic communities. We are starting this work by taking a critical assessment of our own policies, our own programs, and our own engagements, and how they are either supporting and uplifting marginalized racial or ethnic communities in each country, or at facing the hard truth and acknowledging where we are falling short in addressing their marginalization. So we're starting with ourselves. And that's critically important because, as President Biden says, we are more most effective when we lead not by the example of our power, but by the power of our example. But I'm glad you brought that up because, you know, Often when we talk about these issues coming from an American, people might think that your work is going to be focused almost exclusively on domestic matters. Uh, how do you see racial equity and justice figure into America's foreign policy? Uh, what's been missing, in your view, from the global conversation? Yeah, that's an excellent question. We have seen how every major crisis that we are facing today, whether it be COVID-19, climate change, food insecurity, democratic backsliding, has a disproportionate impact on members of marginalized racial and ethnic communities. When we fail to acknowledge that, our policies are not going to be as effective or enduring. So when we apply that lens to our work, um, as Secretary Blinken has said, we know that embedding equity across our foreign affairs work will increase the visibility of racial and other inequities and will lead to better informed foreign policies that will reduce the barriers to equality worldwide. If you look um, at, at sort of our audience on the African continent, what are the issues and the specifics of those issues that you'd like the State Department and, and what you will be focusing on through your work, what are the issues that are closest to your heart and that you think deserve the greatest attention right now? That's a really hard question. Um, one, two things are going to be critical in this work and that are very important that I clarify early on. First, this work is not about me being a quote unquote voice for the voiceless. It really is about listening to and centering members of marginalized racial and ethnic communities in our policies. These communities know better than anyone the challenges they face, and they also know better than anyone what they need to overcome these challenges. But for far too long, they have simply been excluded from the rooms where the decisions are being made that impact them. And this is especially true for indigenous communities. Um, and I want to be clear that my portfolio does include indigenous communities and other marginalized ethnic groups around the world. Secondly, this is not about me applying an American lens to the problem. We cannot apply a one-size-fits-all approach. Uh, because while we know that racism, xenophobia, and discrimination are global phenomenon, they are manifested in unique and distinct ways in every single country around the world. So that's why it's critical that we start by listening to the members of these communities, and then that also will be planning to sit down with all of my colleagues across the Department of State um, in each regional bureau to have a, an honest conversation about how these challenges are manifested in their regions and in their countries. And that's how we start uh, because I we cannot take a one-size-fits-all to this approach it will be completely ineffective and I think we'll look uh, quite silly frankly. <laughs> well, is some of your job going to focus on the relationship between the US and African countries uh, between um, what goes on internally in African countries or, or what goes on between African countries uh, or all of the above? Hmm, that's a really interesting question. My mandate is to promote and advance the human rights of members of marginalized racial and ethnic communities. My goal is to also combat systemic racism, discrimination, and xenophobia wherever it exists. So wherever that is true in a country um, or in a region, that's where we will focus. If we come back to you in, let's say, a couple of years' time, what would you hope to have um, accomplished or fundamentally changed uh, in this job and, and in the, this relationship between the United States and African countries? That is such a hard question because this work is not easy. This is, we're dealing with issues and challenges that have been baked into systems and institutions for centuries. 
So it's not going to be flipping a light switch. It really is, as Secretary Blinken likes to describe it, more like turning an aircraft. So I, I have to sort of manage my own expectations that this work is going to be, we're, we have to be engaged in it for the long haul, and we are not going to see sort of uh, immediate shifts, right? But as long as we're working towards progress, that's all I can ask. And in five years or a couple years, if you come back, I would like to report to you that we have effectively embedded a racial and ethnic equity lens into all of our work. What does that mean? It means the way that we do for gender. So let me give you an example. When we're talking about climate change, when we're talking about COVID-19, there is, I think, a broad acknowledgement now across the State Department and across the federal government that women and girls are impacted differently and disproportionately. I want us to look at all those same challenges and say, yes, women and girls are impacted differently, but there's also a different and in, in disproportionate impact on members of marginalized and ethnic communities. How can we support them? How does our response need to be differentiated based on, the, on their specific and disproportionate impact and need? Desiree Cormier Smith, uh, congratulations. Hopefully this isn't our first and last conversation. Thank you so much. <laughs> it's been a pleasure.